What's up, heathens? How y'all doing? I'm the godless engineer, and I critically analyze apologist claims to give you the best arguments and information so that you can stand up and use your voice. Today, we're going to be talking with Dr. Joseph Wilson about why the Q document is real and exists in history, even though everything about it seems to be speculative and just arbitrarily made up to fill a perceived hole in biblical scholarship. Several scholars have pointed out that we do not need the Q document because Luke could have just copied and changed stuff from both Matthew and Mark. And so there's literally no need for a Q document. And the fact that the Q document contains not only sayings, but also narrative material makes it essentially no different from from the Gospel of Matthew. So the question is, why couldn't Q just be the Gospel of Matthew? What distinguishes the Gospel of Matthew from Q? We're going to be talking with Dr. Wilson today about what the pro-Q argument is and why he thinks that it's stronger than the anti-Q argument. So if you heathens want to fuck around and find out why Q probably didn't exist, then please stay tuned. making a good case um but i'm just want to explain to you why the majority opinion hasn't been swayed by the q skeptics and q skeptics are respect you know because there's a respectful dialogue going on across the field between and by the way i'm not a greek scholar i am i am a professional anthropologist and archaeologist and historian i have a lot I have a lot of advanced degrees and a lot of um three different teaching positions in three different disciplines. I've worked in, you know, like evolutionary genet. I mean, I've, I should, should say I've, I've worked in medical genetics. I also teach biological anthropology, human evolution, stuff like that. So I'm like a utility infielder, academic, religion, scholar, historian. Um, my, my linguistic training is not like in new test new Testament stuff, but I have enough familiarity with the lay of the field. And, you know, I know people, in my extended network, like my, my undergraduate advisor is friends with Dr. Ehrman. Um, you know, there, his brother, Bart Ehrman's brother teaches at my alma mater in a different discipline in a biology, biosciences discipline. So it's like, I, um, I, I think I met him once 20 years ago when he came to town. I mean, it's not, um, it's not like I'm deeply an insider by any means, but I just, I'm, I'm somebody who, and I'm not a religious guy, personally, although I'm really interested in the history of religions. And so I teach about like com a lot of comparative religion stuff. So my languages of training are not the ones that are relevant to the Greek manuscript tradition. I have some Latin, but that's not, I mean, that's only relevant in the, like the, you know, some of the translations and stuff. But um, so I'm not going to get into like technical details about like particular, like how words get changed from one manuscript to another, but I want to just talk about the general principles of why the good acre view is not the majority view right it's still okay. and, and and this is not a, a religious apologetics thing this is source critics who tend to be very skeptical of religious truth, truth claims they're only looking at the documents they're looking at the they're making a paleographic argument fundamentally that has nothing to do with whether well, they believe so, this uh, stuff is true or not well, I'm just wondering, can you can you name off like uh, some some scholars or or some resource material? Uh, okay, so that, that you think is is good for defending? There's there's a recent. I mean, you know Carrier, and I'm sure he's actually probably familiar with the literature better than me. I think he's sort of a polemicist, and so he's kind of got like a really hard line position, and he doesn't tend to give the other side much much leeway. And so I, I, I represent a kind of a more uh, middle uh, ground position where I'm like trying to say, you know, it could be, I'm a, I'm Q agnostic. I respect the, the criticisms. There are some legitimate criticism of Q, but I tend to lean towards the, it exists thing. And I don't like the sort of insinuation that it's like made up or pulled out, you know, it's, yeah, it's a hypothetical document, but there's hypotheses about gaps in evidence all over critical studies all over science, all over history. I mean, there are so many missing things in the universe that we can infer well, right. on the basis of other things. And that's sort of like, it's sort of like a reconstruction. And I mean, well, it is, maybe, sorry, go on. Well, I, I was just going to ask maybe um, just so that we're on the same page. Could you, 
could you try to steel man like the uh, the argument against Q just very basically? Right. Well, so it's it's really complicated. There's a lot of different arguments for and against that you can take really different positions on the big picture and and come at it from a lot of different angles. So I wouldn't feel like I could give you the authority, and it's not a case that I make personally, so I can't give the authoritative thing. But I think Carrier puts it in a nutshell on his blog. He just does a little more harsh than I would, but he sort of points out that a lot of it is about subjective interpretation of the author's intent. And when you see a lot of like, so in other words, we know that the synoptic tradition, so the three synoptic gospels, Mark, almost everyone believes Mark is first. Um, Matthew and or Luke are closely positioned in the second and third place with some debate about whether you know, which one of them came second, which one came third. Most people agree that it's Matthew second, Luke third. There's another anti-Q argument. There's two anti-Q arguments. One is the Goodacre hypothesis. So you read Goodacre's work, you'll get the best sort of most kind of popular anti-Q argument now is, is represented by, by Goodacre's defense of the Ferrer hypothesis. And there's a recent anthology like from 2015 that's a bunch of scholars defending the Ferrer hypothesis, including Olson, who you probably know, Ken Olson, who's, um, whose carrier cites him about the testimonium Flavianum, which is his, you know, the, because he thinks it's a whole cloth interpolation, unlike many scholars who think it's partially interpolated, that, that, that particular passage. That's why mythicists like, like Ken Olson on that issue alone, not on his other stuff. Is Ken Olson he's a also, mythicist? What's that? He's not a mythicist, but he's a Q skeptic, and he's um, and he agrees with mythicists on some. It, he was interviewed on Derek's channel, re, relatively recently, and you can see him defending his view that the testimonium is completely fake, and that maybe the two Jameses aren't actually Jesus's brother. But that doesn't. But he still believes that the two, the James referred to by Paul, unlike Carrie here, he, he believes the James referred to by Paul is the James referred to by Josephus. He just thinks. Well, it's yeah, but can can we can, as far as like the Josephus thing? Can we at least agree that the amount of scholars that have uh, the, the amount of scholars that suggest that the testimonium uh, is uh, a whole cloth interpolation or insertion into Josephus's work, uh, the testimony of Flavianum, that is. Uh, can, can we at least agree that that number of scholars has only grown in recent years? Uh, I don't I don't know. I can't because I'm not there's arguments about that. You can see I, I, I don't want to get on that turf because it's not. Let's let's keep it focused on the one issue. There's a lot of weeds we could go into. Watch Olson's interview on Derek's podcast. That's very recent and he covers it really well. Um, and so I don't want to like I don't want to try to to cover that from memory. He makes the case that the reason why there isn't more supporters is because some of the biggest specialists have recently died, right? And they haven't had a chance to be persuaded. It's true that you're dealing with a very small number of qualified specialists who are really well-versed in the material. And, and Olson has tr been trying to make inroads with them for a long time and having, I guess, some success. But there's, you know, there's a counter response that's going to be coming, I think, eventually along to that video. So I, 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 it's not what I'm here to talk about, but I'm just saying that's where you might be familiar with the guy's work. He writes one of the things. So there's a bunch of scholars who are defending the Ferrer hypothesis, which is mostly associated now with Goodacre, which is the notion that Matthew comes second and then Luke copies Matthew and Mark. So the mm -hmm. two source, so you know, the three source tradition is, you know, Mark gets used by both later synoptics. The two source tradition would, or the double tradition, I should say. The double tradition is the notion that what Matthew and Mark closely, ma sorry, Matthew and Luke closely agree about, what they agree strongly with each other about, is material that they're, for more than a century, people believe that they're dealing with a lost second source that's as old or older than Mark. And that's the, 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 the quelle, the the Logia source, possibly the one referenced by Papias, the genre and a genre similar to the Gospel of Thomas, a collection of sayings. It has the reconstruction has some narrative structure, a little bit of like storytelling around it, but the a, a very conservative reconstruction of it, which is based on Marcion's gospel, would get rid of all that narrative stuff, and it would be a really pure sayings text, just like sayings and nothing else. 
Um, that, so th that has been kind of the majority view for a long time because there's major agreements in that material and major well, disagreements outside that material. Well, so, no, no, as far as far as what's in the Q document, number one, we don't know what's no, in the Q document. No, we do know. You know, we, we have several really good reconstructions and they vary a little bit. So there's disagreement about whether like, whether yeah, those are all how, arbitrary. how much of the baptism material is there, but all that narrative stuff is spec a little bit speculative. The, the, the Q material is, what is it? It's a way of, it's a hypothesis for explaining the, the, the double tradition or the, yeah, the double tradition, which is where do Matthew and Mark have strong, I mean, I'm sorry, Matthew and Luke have strong verbatim agreement where there's no, nothing in Mark to give them that, right? There's strong, so in other words, let, let me use a genetic. Does, doesn't doesn't this require the authors of Matthew and Luke to be incapable of making up their own information? Yeah, no, they're not. They obviously are, and they edit. You can see that people edit and change the work that they have before them. Okay, but well then, how do you distinguish between when they make things up out of whole cloth or just make things up for their own narrative and? what's in the Q document. Well, like it seems like there's not a good criteria for distinguishing. Well, hold between on. The two. You know, there, I mean, like Bart Ehrman would, would get into other early sources that he calls M and L and those are getting into more speculation. And you're right that there's less general consensus about the existence of M and L, which are the, the areas where you don't have corroboration between the, the synoptics where they're really going out on their own and anything that is only in one of the three Right. I should say, well, postmark anything that is only in Matthew or Luke and not in the other one and not in Mark, then, yeah, it could be something that's being composed by the person. Like, you know what I mean? Like written, like narrative fiction, if you want to say that. But mm -hmm. it. The standard view is that they're probably relying on traditions, some of which may be written. These are literary pro products. And. They were very, they had other sources. Luke talks about multiple sources he's using. He doesn't yeah, talk Yeah, about, but he doesn't name them. He doesn't give no, any kind of indication of what to. they are. He doesn't have well, to. He I says, mean, I have a bunch if he's going to act now. like, well, yeah, but I mean, if Luke is going to act like he's a historian or try to make no. his gospel look as if it's trying to record history, then, I mean, you would you need to have a discussion where he's on changing, your sources. You can see where he changes existing texts to match his own agenda. Like when he right. edits Mark to reflect his own views, that's, mm -hmm. that's normal. That's what people do. They say, here's where I disagree with this source. And here I'm going to change it to reflect my own views. The uh, notion, okay, that, so the notion well, that he's composing stuff out of thin air, in addition to that, is possible. Undoubtedly, he is writing things that are original to him. But the notion that anything that isn't previously attested must have been pulled out of thin air. That is, a, you have to very closely look at each thing and look, does how does it fit with Luke's agenda and where where in the community could ideas like that come from? Like, like Paul is always quoting other lost letters and some of which are clearly quotations of previous letters. We don't have them. He doesn't name the author. You know, some Corinthian dude wrote this to Paul and Paul is critiquing and quoting it. You can see where the quote begins and ends. Nobody is saying Paul made that up. He's using a, a letter that's now lost. Most letters are lost. Most texts are lost. We well, know yeah, that there but, are lots of documents that are lost. And the notion well, right, that they but, are not. But Paul, Paul gives us internal indications that he's quoting from like some, some, some right. other document. We don't have that at all in the Gospels. Right, because like, they're, they're not in the epistolary genre. They're not writing letters in response to other letters. They're writing, they're correcting um a they're, hagiographies. They're, they're, they're writing a corrected version of a narrative account. And so they're, and they're using, and we know that Luke is using multiple sources to do this. If Goodacre is right, he's using Mark and Luke. If the conventional view is right, he's using Mark and Q. And that the other stuff well, is that's kind of like Matthew. I'm sorry, not Mar Mar he's using Mark and Matthew. It's so the stuff that's kind of like Matthew, like it's like a little bit similar to Matthew, but not literally dependent, not like like really different. That stuff is 
either coming from other texts or it's something that he's writing on his own, like in the style of the, 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 the kind of thing he's doing. But the two source material is verbatim agreement, right? There is a documentary basis for Luke using text that is word for word out of Matthew. And you have to explain why he does it in chunks. Why, why is it there are these huge chunks of verbatim agreement and why do they correspond to the sayings material so closely? And, and there are, but, but we don't know that. What do you mean? We don't know that it corresponds with the quote unquote sayings material. Yeah. We don't have the sayings material. No, we're, it's in both documents. It's written out in both documents. It's reconstructed on the basis of comparing. It's like, it's like, no, have, but, but yeah, you understand how this comes across to me as just inventing a source that says what you want it to say. No, no. Many sources are preserved through other sources. Some are explicitly so. Sometimes they say you. It's clear that they're quoting something. It's also mm -hmm. other times clear when you have redactional layers. Documents are edited and recombined in new ways, and some of the source texts survive, and we know they survive. If if Mark was lost, and by the way, Mark could have been lost. Mark was not well preserved. The the text stream for Mark early on was poor, right? It, we only have in terms of like manuscripts from the third century or before, we have like two of Mark, where you have like 10 of John or something like that. You know what I mean? In other words, there are documents, ancient documents were lost all the time. And we know because Mark exists as a real document, we know that it was heavily mined by both Matthew and Luke, and they did it in different ways. In other words, we know for a fact that they weren't dependent on each other for their Mark material. They got their Mark material from Mark and not from each other. Because the changes they make in Mark, for the mm, most that's part, not a, are their own. No, that's, yeah, that's not own. exactly true. There's this there one are portion. That's one of the, so, so you asked me to make the case against Q. The strongest case against Q is on the basis of the minor agreements, the so-called minor agreements. But in the Q material, in the, well, not, not in the Q material, in the Markin material, there are occasions when changes of our canonical Mark are apparent in both of the derived sources indicating that this either either they independently did the same redactional change of mark which is, seems unlikely or one of them depends on the other this is the biggest obstacle for q the biggest obstacle for q are the small and and carrier talks about this a lot in his blog there are lots of them but they're really tiny and not majorly important like they're most of them are like subtle changes in wording that are seen in both of these two documents, but not in the original. So therefore you'd say, hey, somebody's copying this person. I'm copying off your paper. He's copying off my paper because my changes to your work appear in his work over there. So that's the essence of the argument for the fairer hypothesis that, that has just one document that's used by the next and then that document and the first document are used by the third document. Because they say these little changes to Mark that appear in Matthew and then also appear in Luke, that argument against Q is that disproves Q. Because well, you don't so, need, you can't because you can't get there if you don't have the intermediate step. But there's mm -hmm. several important, easy ways around that for Q proponents. And I can get to that if you're if you are with me on the same page so far. And, and well, I, I, so uh, what, what I was just going to say was that I, I, I feel like in, uh, uh, I guess, a bit more general way that, that I understand it is, is that Q, the Q document is actually indistinguishable from uh, Matthew. Like the, there's there's no way that you can actually uh, distinguish between content that's, um, you know, in Matthew uh, and, and the content that's supposedly in Q because we don't have the Q document. We don't know what was in the Q document. We have speculations about what was in the Q document. But no, but that's it's, about it's, it. It's source criticism and source criticism is involved. It involves comparing different versions of the same text and inferring based on various criteria, which is the more primitive version. And this is where, why Q exists. Q exists because the complex interdependency between Luke and Matthew is not unidirectional. This is the key. This is why Q exists. This is why Q has been a strong paradigm for 100 years.
the complex interdependence between Matthew and Luke appears to go one direction if you're looking in one place and another direction if you're looking in another place. And the conventional wisdom is because Luke, even though it's later, pre preserves a less edited form of Q. So the Q material that appears in Luke has fewer, fewer rhetorical modifications than the Q, the same material that appears in Matthew. Matthew is earlier, but it's heavily rhetorical, rhetoricized. In other words, Matthew takes the sayings texts, which are believed by most scholars to be a lost independent document that are a collection of like the wit and wisdom of, of Jesus of Nazareth, right? Like the like this body of words attributed to Jesus that does not have a lot of narrative framing, maybe a little bit, you know, the depth temptation of the devil and the, you know, and, and the John the Baptist stuff. But even that kind of go disappears when you look at some of the earliest documents like Marcion's text you have. So, so, so in the purest, most conservative form, we're talking about a bunch of the sayings of Jesus that are in Matthew and Luke, but not in Mark. And the narrative framing of these sayings is very different in both of these Gospels. See what I'm saying? So here's where the border of Q exists. It's like when you're looking at mostly the sayings material, a little bit of the narrative stuff, but mostly the sayings material, you get such close verbatim agreement <coughs> between these two sources, and it's not a mark. So you can't use mark to explain the existence of the common material. So the Good Acre people would say, Luke is adapting Matthew and choosing to preserve some stuff real close yeah. and other stuff ignoring completely. So that's the... That doesn't, doesn't Luke do that with Mark, though? Well, that's kind of the case that that um, Carrier makes in his blog, and that's the case that... Well, I mean, good, good Acre, Golder, like multiple scholars make this, this uh, particular uh, uh, argument. When, when, Luke, when Luke changes Mark it usually has a clear reason. It's a usually, and just like when Matthew changes Mark. And, and in the case of Luke changing Mark, he often leaves it kind of the hell alone unless he has a reason to change it that mass, matches his rhetorical agenda, which is clearly distinct from Mark. I don't think that's so, true. So like, like, look, like when we see, when we see Luke monkeying with Mark, it's because he has a, di why is he rewriting it, right? He says, there's these other versions but I'm going to give you the best version. He, he's not doing this because it does, you know, he thinks Mark is fine. He thinks Mark needs to be fixed. He's correcting Mark and he's making Mark match what he thinks the story of Jesus should say. So when he changes okay. things, it, events, narrative structures in Mark, it's to match his, his, uh, his particular theology, which is different from Mark's Mark and Luke. What, are what prevents, what prevents Luke from doing the exact same thing to Matthew, though? He there and the anti Q arguments would say that. So you're correctly getting at the basis for the Q skepticism. They say, well, Mark is subject to such kinds of changes, these kinds of changes. Why wouldn't Matthew be? The case is because most of those changes are rhetoric in in the Q material are rhetorically neutral. They they do align a little bit with Luke's views of like the poor and things like that. But generally, you don't know that, though. What's that? But I mean, we don't know that. What? what yeah, because we can't get in, this is this is Carrier saying you can't get inside the author's head. You can read the whole text. Well, I mean, you're framing all word. of this as if it's just Carrier saying it, but it's not just Carrier saying it. It's Carrier. It's Goodacre. It's Golder. Like there's there's you're multi, right. like you're, you're really is, harping Carrier on Carrier. A, Carrier is a radical proponent of what is a what is a <laughs> one argument Radical. within the discipline, but you're missing something if you think that these arguments are just out of thin air. You're, you pay attention for a second. Are you, you know what link, linkage di disequilibrium is in like genetics? Do you know uh, why I mean, I'm not know? a geneticist, so. Okay, so you, I know, I've seen you do like evolution and stuff on your channel. So I just thought maybe, it, like we know that we interbred with Neanderthals 100,000 years ago mm -hmm. and not 50 years ago because the DNA fragments from the Neanderthal admixture are through um, recombination hotspots throughout the Z genome have become diffused, right? Their selection has favored some little snippets, but they're not like together. There isn't like this big chunk of Neanderthal DNA in our genome. All that Neanderthal stuff is like ancient. And so it's like spread out and like diffused. 
The okay. key material are consists of the sayings decks, which are these contiguous chunks of close verbatim agreement, always or mostly about the sayings attributed to Jesus. And one here's one here's one case for Q that I don't think the anti-Q argument addresses strongly enough. Doublets. Doublets reflect where people believe Mark and Q overlap in that they're describing something very similar, the same scene with slightly different details, right? So like there are case parts of Q and parts of Mark that are different versions of the same story, right? Where, where Q, Q, we're talking about the reconstruction of Q, which you, you can go and read the reconstruction on like earlychristianwritings.com or something. You can go read one of the good reconstructions. There's several different reconstructions. They're all very similar to each other with slight disagreements. But so the, you go look at Q and you compare the a certain parable or a certain story in Q to one in Mark. And you say, wow, Mark and Q are both telling essentially the same story here, but they're doing it in slightly different ways. And one of the two evangelists would pick one or the other, right? Like Matthew might say, I'm going to pick this version. Um, Luke might say, I'm going to pick this version of the two choices. But one of them might say, ah, they're different enough. I'm going to use both. So when you see Matthew and you, Luke using doublets, where they're basically repeating the same event described in Q and in Mark, that is something that the Goodacre hypothesis, hypothesis cannot quite deal with. Can and you give an example? Also, also places where the minor agreements have a strong indication of a different gradient. <clears throat> Right, like in other words, where the minor agreements don't always favor Matthew, Matthew priority, the minor agreements well, so, sometimes favor the reverse priority, which indicates well, so, the text, the, the original form of the text was something in between and lost. Well, so when, when I hear you talking about like the doublets thing, I mean, I I don't see anything that's preventing Luke from copying what Matthew did and then changing it a little bit. I mean, the, we actually have evidence of that happening in in Luke's gospel of, right. of him directly doing that. So, of course, it, and you know what? Some sometimes people have played that argument in favor of Clu, of Q too hard or too too vigorously. That's not that's not the issue. The issue is the minor agreements and the fact that the the minor the main thing that makes Q look weak to us just to compare just on a basis of a straight up comparison of the documents the main thing that look, makes q look weak is the so-called minor agreements the places where mark differs from both of the later gospels in places where they refer, where they change mark in the same exact ways that is the strongest piece of evidence against q right there all that other stuff is speculation all of it is about you know what i mean like I see it this way. I see it that way. There's no like firm evidence one way or the other. The, the, the minor agreements are it. And here's why people don't regard the minor, minor agreements as insurmountable. The further you get back into the text streams and the more unredacted and ancient your original manuscripts are, the fewer minor agreements survive, meaning the minor agreements tend to fall out of the picture when you get the better older documents. Why is this important? It means those minor agreements are often orthodox harmonizations, orthodox corruptions that are designed to take these documents that are different and make them the same. And this is especially gonna happen to the later two synoptics because they were both more popular than Mark. So Mark is kind of, it doesn't get reproduced as much. It sits there and it remains kind of stagnant in its form. Whereas Luke and Luke is about twice as many ancient manuscripts of Luke survive as Mark. And so it's getting copied and recopied twice as often. And it has a wider range of possible changes happening. Matthew gets copied a ton more. And the people who are copying Luke, right, people who are transcribing Luke, have probably transcribed Matthew twice as often as they've transcribed Luke because there's more copies and it's more it's a more like it's a more important tradition in the early church than Luke is. So Luke gets copied like less if it's getting copied less than Matthew and people are remembering Matthew because scribes are humans and they're doing things from memory 
And if, if they're taking the double tradition, right? The double tradition is the place where Matthew and Matthew and Luke overlap, or the triple tradition, it doesn't matter. The, the, all the ways that the two gospels align with each other, they're going to, just through the sort of normal subconscious behavior of copying, they're going to accidentally change the grammar and wording to make them match. And we know this is the case because the further you undo these orthodox harmonizations, these corruptions that result in the convergence of the text types, right? <laughs> you undo them and Q doesn't get weaker. Q gets stronger the more of the minor agreements you take out of your picture. In other words, the, the integrity of the similarity I mean, in other words, Q itself remains. Like, here's an example. Marcion's gospel. Marcion's gospel gets rid of the narrative frame for Q. So the Q material in, the Mar in Marcion's gospel is pretty much pure Q. It's uninterpolated. It's un unredacted. It lacks a lot of those orthodox harmonizations I talk about, the so-called minor agreements. So in other words, you're getting back to a more primitive form of Luke, and you're seeing that it doesn't resemble it doesn't resemble Matthew in the ways that it does in the later text stream. So in other words, if you were to go back in time and to reverse all reverse engineer these known document changes, and you were to find, wow, Q's looking weaker and less, there's less integrity to the Q material. Then you'd be like, yeah, Q doesn't look very strong. But that's not what ha has happened, right? The minor agreements don't seem to have the, the power to push Q off the, the pedestal because they don't uniformly get, a, you know, um, they don't uniformly appear in the oldest sources. Now, that's not to say that there aren't some. There are some really tricky minor agreements that are widely spread. But even those have very plausible explanations if you're a Q proponent. Like, so let's talk about the Beelzebub, uh, sorry, Beelzebub controversy. Are you familiar with this, the Beelzebub controversy? It's one of the trickiest things in the synoptic problem. It's one of the biggest thorns of all, anyone who's working on the synoptic problem has a hard time with this passage because it has such complex three-way interdependence between the three synoptics, right? You have kind of this weird little section in Mark that has the, the, the where, where the people in Nazareth accuse Jesus of being the devil, because he's casting out devils in the name of the devil, right? And I'm not going to get into the details of it, but let's just say that some of the Q material might come into play in it because you get an expansion and a revision and a rearrangement of it in the other two, right? In a complicated way where they depend on each other and Mark, they don't, where you can't easily derive it from Mark into Matthew and then from Matthew into Luke. In other words, people have been arguing over which, what's the order of operations, right, to get to these. And this is one of the worst, the most difficult of the so-called minor agreements, where it's got elements from Mark, elements from Q, doublets. But again, so this looks really, really tricky. And some people, and this is the favorite thing for people who argue for um, Lucan priority, Mathean posteriority. Do you know what I mean when I say Mathean posteriority? This is the other camp in the anti, there's two ty types of anti-Q. There's the good acre people who are, who say it's um, Mark, then Matthew, then Luke. And then there's the, the, uh, the Mathean posteriority school that says it's Mark, Proto Luke, which is, might be different than the Luke we have, but it's like a more primitive version of Luke. And then after Proto Luke, Matthew, and then maybe later Act, the, the revision of Luke that gives us Acts and all the, all that, like the full fledged Luke might still be after Matthew. But there's a vert, according to the, the Mathean. I mean, so can I ask you, can I, can, can I ask you a quick question? What, well, yeah. I mean, in your view, is a lot of this kind of historical research just like what what can we just make up in order to make our particular hypothesis plausible? Because I mean, the, the way that you're describing this is just people are like, oh, well, if this is the case, then we would have to invent this document and invent this no. document and invent it, this document. It's a, hy and it, 
it's a it's a very clearly defined hypothetical document. It is not some wild speculation. It co- corresponds it to the, the pieces of very close verbatim agreement between the second two of the Synoptic Gospels that's not supported by Mark. So we know that they depend on each other. It's impossible for that. It's like the level of verbal agreement is such these are genetically related texts. The question is, is is one copying off the other or is the other copying off the one or are they both depending on a previous sources? Those are the only three possibilities. One of those three possibilities is definitely right. Either one is either Matthew's copying Luke, Luke's copying Matthew, or they're both copying a lost sayings text. The fact that people have favored the third option is because the text critical factors do not decisively weigh in favor of one or the other two scenarios. Otherwise, everyone would agree with Goodacre. They don't. Goodacre cannot explain the, the, nature of the, the, the nature of some of those minor agreements, which favor the reversal of the gradient of dependence. See what I'm Are saying? Are you sure he can't? Because these texts don't have a clear priority. And that is strongly indication that there is a third missing document that is in that is intermediate, like a common ancestor document. Uh, well, I know that you got to go here in a second, but I mean, you say that he can't can explain know. these things, but I mean, I I kind of I have I have his Q book. I feel like he has a way to explain these things. Well, yeah. does he literally say I can't explain no, this? No, but and and it is okay. in a nutshell. It's kind of like what Carrier says. He, you know, it's appeal to incredulity, which is valid. I mean, I shouldn't say it's not. All appeal to incredulity is not fallacious. There's nothing wrong with saying, I find this to be unbelievable. So therefore, I'm going to speculate this other scenario. So there's a lot of like incredulity about specific common ways of viewing material that's in the Q material. So like, for example, what would a standard argument for Q that's that the, the good acres people are skeptical of is that Q represents a simpler version of the sayings material that is more, that is better preserved in the later source, Luke, right? And is the integrity of the Q material is worse in the earlier source, Matthew, because so Luke is taking the original document that they both depend on and using it in ways that are um, less, he's being less editorial about it, right? That's that's the argument. He's less editorial because he's just using it, whereas Matthew is putting all this Ma- Math- Matthew stuff into it. And that in order to get for Luke to undo all that and, and reverse engineer a document that looks like Q, he would have to do things that make no sense from his own rhetorical perspective. And, you know, Carrier and other people could say, how should we know? He might have had his reasons. That is a reasonable criticism, but it is not convincing when you are dealing with the quantity of specific arguments that we're dealing with. Like, here's another example. Transcriptional fatigue. There are places when, because because Matthew is constantly putting Matthew's theology into the document. He is really heavy-handed about putting Matthew's view on the Q material and the other material. And so when he goes through and he changes kingdom of God, because he's Jewish and he doesn't want to say kingdom of God, he wants to say kingdom of heaven. So every time he sees kingdom of God in Q, he revert, he ter- puts the more Jewish Christian friendly kingdom of heaven language in there instead. Uh, until very late in the document when he's getting tired. And, and that's fit transcriptional or, you know, translator's fatigue. He's getting tired and then he starts to let it slip. And in Matthew, you get the form you see in Luke start to appear because after so many times, it's like, like, imagine I'm trying to pronounce a name differently. Like, I want to say, I'm used to saying Marcion, but I want to say Marcion. I like that pronunciation better. It makes me sound like I'm speaking Latin. So I, but I'm used to saying Marcion. And the first 40 times I say Marcion, I say Marcion, right? But then the one time late in the interview, I let it slip and I say Marcion. I shift from a hard C to a soft C. And that's because I'm no, you know, I'm not on it. So that's the kind of thing you see those places in Matthew where you see the 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 primitive form of Q slipping through his efforts to add Matthew's rhetoric. Whereas Luke is going through 
and he's reproducing the same verbatim material without any of the math, Matthew's theology, even when Matthew's theology is neutral with respect to Luke's project, right? So even in places where it wouldn't matter, where it has no bearing whatsoever on what Luke is trying to do, he still reverts back to the more quote unquote primitive form. This is one of those cases where, where Carrier and Goodacre would say, you know, who's to say? We, he might have had reasons we just don't know. But it is the there. But if that's not the only argument for Q. We're, I got five more minutes. I'd say the other arguments for Q is the very major disagreements lack any semblance of that 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 literary dependence. Like the the verbatim agreements of the Q material are like astronomically high. The verbatim disagreements of the non-Q material that's not in Mark is very, very low. And so Goodacre argues that there's some thematic resemblance, like, like, like the structure of the documents or the, the general kinds of plot is similar, indicating some kind of interdependency. And I actually think that's a pretty good argument because I don't see a reason why they, Luke might not have seen Matthew. Right? It's not to say that Luke could never have seen Matthew. The argument for Q doesn't say that Matthew and Luke were foreign planets that didn't have any connection. The argument for Q is that their verbatim agreement comes from an earlier text that they both, like Mark, that they both depended on, and that that structural similarity came from their genre conventions in common or from you know, the fact that they were both doing a similar project. So it's not and like like McDonald is one of these people who says that that Luke can still know Matthew and also use Q. That the, the the problem is that the that the Matthew's use of the Q material is just so different than Luke's, and Luke's doesn't have the clear rhetorical agenda that you see in Matthew's. Um, but you understand how, you, for, at least in in my view, from what I understand of our discussion. You're not you're not distinguishing for me like anything that means that Luke definitely did not just copy Matthew and change things and then add his own information that he either got from the scriptures or he just made up whole cloth. Um, you know, you, you, there's no information that seems to distinguish like that that from there being a Q source. It, it just makes it really seem technical. like the Q source pops out of nowhere no. just so that people can can it, you know, it gets really technical. We're does. talking about we're talking about really small linguistic nuances here that 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 favor derivation in one or two possible directions. In other words, if you regard the Q material as being in a more original form in the later document, right? And the less original form in the earlier document, then an earlier precursor document is really the only way to do that. And you're right that you can postulate that Luke somehow reverse engineered something that looks like Q. And that's essentially what the ant the the that's ant not what I said though. Say, that he's ma he's managing to reverse engineer a re uh, the, the sayings things. But there's other arguments for Q for the existence of Q that have nothing that are not at that level. There's other arguments at the big holistic level. And this is where I get back into link, linkage. I was talking about linkage disequilibri disequilibrium. The textual integrity of the, of the, and the close verbal agreement of the Q material is so starkly different from the lack of that agreement outside the Q material and outside of Mark that you would have, you have to imagine that the writer is like completely turning a switch when you get to the sayings. Right, like the sayings are being treated differently than the than the narrative material, and that doesn't work when you look at the way both of them use Mark. Yes, of course, Mark gets used rhetorically by Luke. Mark's Mark's atonement theology is done away with by Luke, but Luke is still using Mark's verbal content in ways that are very different than Matthew's. And you can see, so in other words, you can see their habits for how they use sources by comparing how the two use use Mark. And when you when you do, and so the notion that we can't get inside Luke's head is true, I guess. But you can see what this editor is doing with Mark, and you can see that Q 
that he's not as heavy handed with his material as Matthew is. Right. Luke is a less heavy handed editor, except in, you know, he inserts theological differences, but he's not hung up on some of the details the way Matthew is. Matthew is kind of anal about injecting a particular Jewish Christian theology into the Markan narrative that. And, and Luke isn't right. So this affects the way the, the double tradition material appears in both. Could Luke be saying, I need to undo all of this Matthew stuff? It doesn't, it doesn't seem, you know, the, the notion that, that Matthew is writing a document that's half Mark and half made up is also not necessarily realistic. I mean, yeah, it, it looks, the double tradition, the notion of the double tradition combining two sources is made stronger when you look at the most primitive gospel text we have, like, again, Marcion. When you look at Marcion's version of the Gospel of Luke, which is closer to Proto-Luke, the double tradition material is there. One third of Q appears in the Gospel according to Thomas, which I know Carrier believes that's a late derivative of the synoptics, but that doesn't work when you look at every logia. Uh, there are logions in the Gospel of Thomas, that appear to, again, have a more, an earlier form, right, a more complete and original structure than the other canonical ones. So, in other words, when you, you have to look at every piece, every piece of the literary record side by side, and you make inferences about which direction the changes happened. And some of those inferences may be wrong. But the overwhelming consensus of scholars is that the derivation of Matthew from a primitive text like the Q material in Luke is more likely than the other way around, right? The, can the, consensus the, what be wrong? Advocating. What, what Goodacre is advocating is that that is an illusion and that we just don't know what Luke's real agenda was. But whatever his real agenda was, it created the simpler and less messy, less complicated form of the so-called double tradition. Do you, th do you think that we know what Luke's agenda was? We don't know for sure, but we can say, we can say, I mean, looking again at Marcion's. So we don't know, but we do. Know. And looking at, which is, by the way, it wasn't attributed to Luke. Just let's just remember that, that the name Luke gets attached to it later. So the, the gospel that is the, the basis for Luke is a, it's a double tradition where either Matthew or Luke are combining two sources, right? Either Matthew or Luke are combining two sources. The Q proponents say they're both doing it, right? They're both doing that independently. The people who argue against Q saying only one is doing it, the other one is writing from memory or writing from their, you know, their own experience. But the majority of scholars believe that the later source is the earlier version of one of the two source texts. And this is based on a lot of very subtle grammatical changes. And the fact that you see more complex modifications of the material in Matthew and Luke, who is not that, doesn't have that much attention to detail when it comes to the minor modifications of Mark. He's more, I mean, sometimes he simplifies stuff, sure. Sometimes he edits it down, but it's usually with a clear purpose in mind. When he does that to Matthew without a reason, when it doesn't affect the outcome of the text, and particularly when he does it in ways that that make the text look like more like what the un methan original would, right? This is why the majority of scholars think that there is indeed a lost logia text. By the way, the Papias. When he described Matthew, he was not describing our Matthew. But are you aware of this? That the first reference to the Gospel of Matthew is definitely not the Greek narrative gospel we have and now attributed to Matthew. He described it as a you, uh, just Before you go, you understand that not even Dr. Bart Ehrman believes this, right? It believes what? The thing, like... The, you know, not even he believes that, that the, the Matthew Gospel as mentioned by Papias is like... Like, like the 
I don't know. I, I feel like you're saying that there's an earlier version of Matthew that was written in Hebrew because no, that's what no, I'm not. Papias says. I'm not. I'm not. I, I'm not saying that there's an earlier version of Matthew. I'm saying whatever he was talking about wasn't the Matthew we know. I have no idea what that actual document was that he's talking about, but he mentions a, it was Logia. It was sayings of the Jesus of Jesus. And it was referring. Uh, so, you, so, you, so you're saying Papias was referring to Q there. He was testifying to the existence of this genre of document at that period. And we were then, and by the way, Q was predicted on the basis of text criticism long ago. Then the gospel of Thomas was discovered, which is a pure sayings document. In other words, the genre, the existence of the genre, the, the fact that the genre of the saying source was did not exist was one of the primary objections to Q when it was first proposed. There's no such thing as a sayings text in early Christianity. Then what happened? They found a Coptic sayings text. It's not Q. Thomas is a later, a later thing, not Q, but it has the genre conventions that we expect for Q. So that, I mean, this is something that Carrier dismisses because it's late, but it cannot be, it, it, it is proof of concept, right? The fact that there are early tra traditional Christian sayings texts, and there's early Greek versions that are more orthodox. We know this because the, the Oxyrhynchus shroud has a version of a, um, of a, uh, one of the Logia from Thomas is written inside the shroud, and it's written in a way that has an, uh, that talks about the bodily resurrection of the dead, which you don't see in the Gnostic uh, Coptic version. You only see it in the, in the Greek version, which is the precursor, indicating that like Elaine Pagels has a basis for claiming that elements of Thomas are early. And it, and um, the material in the synoptic and the material in the synoptic tradition that appears in Thomas is almost all located also in Marcion's gospel, which might be the early, one of the early forms of the two source tradition. All right. How, how does any of this? Down. Yeah. Yeah. I know you got to go. There's my son. He needs to go. Yeah. He needs me to go feed him. So he's going to stand there until until I leave. Okay. All right. Well, I appreciate your time, uh, uh, Dr. Wilson. Can I, yes. should I call you Dr. Um, Wilson? Um, we can, um, and, and if you want me to correspond, I can provide some sources on this topic. Again, I don't claim to be an expert. I just wanted to try and clear up some of these basic uh, misunderstandings, in my opinion. And um, I'm, I mean, I'm not an expert on Q, that is. It's just something I happen to have read about. So, um Thank you again for your time, and I will uh, see you uh, I, hopefully again. Yeah, All definitely. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Bye. bye. Have a bye. great dinner. <laughs> Whew. Well, heathens, that was an interesting uh, interaction there. I didn't really feel like I was able to get uh, too many words in edgewise. Um, and I really wish that I could have gotten some examples of what he was talking about because abstractly talking about how, well, Matthew doesn't do this or Luke doesn't do that without giving me, you know, exact examples, it, it kind of, I don't know, it didn't really mean much to me. That's not to say that he doesn't have a point, but, um, without specific examples of how these things, uh, uh, you know, work as far as he understands it. I, I'm not able to really, you know, say anything about it. Um, th there was one example where I was talking about how um, Luke actually copies from Matthew instead of copying from Mark. And that's when the Roman soldiers uh, were like, spitting in Jesus's face. In Mark, uh, basically Mark just says that they covered his eyes, while in Matthew, it says that they spit in his eyes. And then uh, Luke copies Matthew, preferring Matthew's version of it, and then, uh, you know, changing it uh, a little bit. Um, you know, uh, obviously preserving a little bit of Mark, but also preserving the extended portion of Matthew in it. So it, it's quite odd to hear someone say that, well, you know, Luke, Luke copied from Matthew, but also copied from Q and also copied from Mark. It just, it, it kind of makes it a little bit more complicated than I think that it needs to be. And 
I know that Dr. Wilson really kind of focused on Dr. Carrier and his opinion on this, but my opinion on Q not being a real document is for one, based on the fact that they have to speculate it and arbitrarily insert information into it that fits well with their hypothesis, but also it's built off of multiple people in that, that are experts in this particular area that are, you know, against this Q hypothesis, Mark Goodacre and uh, Golder, uh, they both um, are scholars in, in this particular area that don't agree with the Q, you know, hypothesis. And um, so it, it's, my point is, is that it's more than carry. And I feel like that really needs to be highlighted that it's not just some fringe, crazy kind of idea that, that this is gaining traction in the scholarship. It's being talked about more and the number of scholars that hold this position is growing. So it kind of seems like the appeals to consensus and all this other stuff is just, uh, it means nothing to me. Like I don't care what the consensus says about it. We have experts that dissent with good reason and lay out their reasons in their respective publications. So I think that we need to talk about the actual evidence now rather than whether or not it's a fringe idea. I think these types of ideas are always going to be fringe at first, obviously. So uh, I appreciate Dr. Wilson's time. I hope that I can get uh, somebody else on to try to convince me that Q was a real document, but ultimately I am just not convinced at all. Um, I, I, still feel like Q is an invented source and it's invented and filled with information that's cherry picked from the, the gospels in order to make the hypothesis work. And I just, I really don't feel like that is how history should be done. I don't think that we should just make up whatever sources will fit our hypothesis. I think that we should argue from the evidence that we have and the evidence that we have suggests that Luke copied from Matthew and from Mark and Matthew uh, copied and redacted Mark. So that seems to be the most parsimonious explanation. It's also the simplest explanation rather than inventing proto Luke and proto Matthew and Q and the M and the L sources and all this other stuff. All of that is invented. That just, I don't know, that it just doesn't make sense to me that you would invent sources and then also claim that you know what's in those sources. You don't have the source in order to critically analyze it. So you don't know what's in it. Anyways, let me know what you guys think down below in the comments. I'd love to hear what y'all's thoughts are on this Q hypothesis. Is. Uh, what do you think about Dr. Wilson's position on it? Uh, let me know in the comments. While you're down there, why don't you smash that like button and subscribe if you like this kind of content. Don't forget to stand up and use your voice. Bye! Hey, heathens.